Well, hello and welcome to uh, BIF 2020 Digital. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce you uh, to two of our guests uh, who will be talking today about our production of uh, Stephen Sondheim's wonderful musical, uh, A Little Night Music, which we would have been doing uh, this year, but COVID-19 came crashing through that front door and brought the curtain down. However, we are planning it next year, and I um, thought that as part of our digital process, we would uh, have a conversation with Paul, who will be directing it, and Wynne, who will be conducting it. But Paul Kerrison, first of all, uh, who is the executive director of uh, the Buxton Opera House, and before that, he was the artistic director of the Leicester Theatre Trust. Uh, he's a man of the theatre who has won many prizes and was, in fact, awarded an MBE uh, for his contribution to um, theatre in this country. Um, as the director of the Leicester Theatre Company, uh, Paul had the opportunity of meeting Stephen Sondheim and, in fact, uh, doing a production of Merrily We Roll Along, and we'll talk about that later. And he's directed many uh, musicals in, in his life. He's also a performer too, but I don't think we're going to that uh, this afternoon. Uh, the other thing that Paul is, is that I discovered is that he is um, an organist at his local parish. And for years, he's been leading um, the worship there as a musician, uh, sometimes uh, with guitars and flutes and occasionally the odd drum. So welcome, Paul. It's great to have you with us. <laughs> Love to see you, Michael. Yeah, right. And and Win Davis is um, uh, a, a, a conductor of some huge experience. He joined the Welsh National Opera as a staff conductor. Uh, he also spent time uh, as an assistant conductor at the Metropolitan Opera. Uh, he worked at Banff. Uh, more recently, he was the director of music at New Zealand Opera, and he's steeped in the <laughs> opera and musical world. And uh, he also has conducted for the Buxton Festival on occasion, and uh, we're so pleased uh, that he's involved with us. And, of course, he just lives uh, down the road, so it's wonderful. Uh, so welcome, Wynne, and, and thank you so much for for um, helping us out uh, today. Hi, Michael. Um, <laughs> hi, Paul. <laughs> so, hi. a little night music. Uh, Paul, perhaps we should start with you, your inspiration for this, and, and why you thought this was a good choice for uh, the festival, which had, has, uh, up to this date, never done a musical before. Well, uh, firstly, I think it's wonderful that the festival and the opera house that have been entwined for 40 years are now doing a co-production. I think it's just a wonderful thing. And hopefully the Biff audiences and the musical audiences that the Opera House gets will come together because for me, any Sondheim is a masterpiece. A Little Night Music is especially so because it's just full of fun and wit. And sometimes a book or the lyrics to an opera or a musical can be a challenge, but in this case, it's a perfect fusion of everything and it's intellectually satisfying and it's a, just a wonderful, breezy night out. So for me, it's the perfect choice for this first co-production. And, and when I remember you telling me that you, you said to me that uh, this has to be uh, one of your most favourite musicals of all time. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Well, it's one of the very best ones. I mean, you know, there aren't really any weak links in it. It's got you know, another element that opera doesn't have, the book, which the story and the script, which in this case is by an English playwright called Hugh Wheeler, who is always credited by Sondheim when he's talking about it. It's fantastic. I mean, it's an absolutely first-class play in its own right. And, of course, the great thing about this piece being a departure from Buxton, you know, Buxton is, is very well known for doing things that are slightly off the beaten track, you know, the sort of lesser known pieces of very famous composers like, I don't know, uh, Maria di Rohan of Donizetti or, or Alcira by Verdi, you know, the, the maybe second division pieces by first division composers, that sort of thing, or even sometimes totally unknown pieces by totally unknown composers. But this, this is absolutely not that. That's why it's a departure for Buxton. Uh, you know, he's the top composer. 
of American music theatre. Uh, and Sondheim writes both the words of the music and the music itself. And this fantastic book by Hugh Wheeler. Uh, you've got a first class play, top class lyrics and marvellous music. Mm. It's so interesting. Sometimes Sondheim gets a, a bad rub in the press for the more adventurous works. But with a little night music and Sweeney Todd, <laughs> so often uh, he, he, people speak about how strong the narrative is. And because that narrative is driving uh, the story, his, his music is able to uh, fill it in. And, and he's at best when he tells a damn good story. And, and, and do you find um, that it takes a lot of effort to direct a Sondheim piece, uh, Paul? Because I know you've had huge success with Hairspray. And I was reading in preparation for this and somebody said, well, it's not like putting on Hairspray. Uh, putting on a Stephen Sondheim requires a lot of work and a lot of thinking. Well, of course, uh, in anything. I, 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 I think whether it's Hairspray or A Little Night Music, uh, bringing a creative team together, bringing a cast together, uh, all these things are highly important and uh, it's a lot of hard work. But I have to say, with A Little Night Music, it's, it is especially enjoyable hard work because, because, as Wynne has just said, the book and the lyrics and the music are so perfect, a, an evening of complete wit. Uh, as long as you cast it right, as long as you bring the right creative team together, your work almost becomes less hard because you're surrounded with everybody on the same page. So for me, uh, uh, directing a little night music will be a joy. <laughs> Um, for those of you who don't know a little bit about the piece, it, it's essentially a romantic comedy and it draws on the conventional idea of mismatched lovers trying to find their true loves. And it is, in fact, based on a, a Ingmar Bergman film, uh, which was uh, directed, uh, produced in 1956, Smiles of a Summer Night. And yeah. some of the themes and mood of the play often draw on the traditional um, versions of Midsummer Night's Dream, the mid mismatched lovers um, uh, uh, that all come together on one magical night. Uh, and one of the things that, that struck me about it when I heard it for the first time is that the waltz permeates the entire score when mm. he seems to have fallen in love with the three, four signature. Uh, wh wh why is that such a compelling thing, do you think? Well, I, as far as I'm concerned, the waltz is connected with something nostalgic. There, there, there are two things about it. One is its nostalgia, and two is its connection with Viennese operetta and Viennese music in general. The, the, um, the whole, the beginning of A Little Night Music, which is a sung as well as played overture, where it has five singers singing together in the overture, and the very first words that they sing are um, that old deserted beach we walked along, remember. It's all about remembering something that used to be good and trying to recapture it, that kind of nostalgia. And um, the waltz three-quarter time is the perfect kind of musical meter to try to express mm. that in. Um, now, the thing is with Sondheim, he doesn't do things by heart. He hasn't just written the occasional waltz. Practically every bar, every number in this piece is in threes. I mean, it's an absolutely virtuosic thing from that point of view. You can't imagine how he could possibly do it. You think it would be boring. You think it'd be the sound the same all the time. It absolutely does not. And sometimes you don't even realize that the meter is in three. Mm. You know, he's just absolutely, he's really showing off with his uh, compositional ability. And, and, and of course, it's quite challenging for singers, isn't it? Because he has a complex meter at work and there's often pitch changes. Um, the words come out incredibly, are so important. So it's a quite a challenging piece uh, for uh, your, your average musical theatre singer. And is that why opera companies uh, often tackle this work? Well, I, there are different types of sung music according to the different characters. I mean, the, the characters I just mentioned who sing in the overture are five, what he calls, Liebes leaders. Uh, uh, and they probably have the most singy 
music in it. But there is other music for other characters that is really not singing at all. It's quite a small range. Um, however, sometimes music's never easy. No. There's, the, you know, there are always quirky things about it, difficult rhythms which must be accurate or they don't make any sense. Um, and sometimes um, the melody doesn't go where you think it's going to go. It's always very rewarding from that point of view because you can't just pick it up and sing it. I mm. mean, you know, there are there are of course there are tunes you can just pick up and sing, uh, or at least you can sing the beginning of the tunes. You know. A weekend in the country, how amusing, da 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 It's easy to pick it up. Or, um, I shall marry the miller's son. I mean, it's a very familiar kind of tune, and it, the, there are several of those in it. But they always develop into something a bit more complicated, which is why you are asking, Paul, whether it's difficult to direct. I think it's difficult to, to sing. Mm. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's not so much that there's a wide singing range, it's just being accurate in it is difficult. Mm. And, you know, if you're inaccurate, it's just rubbish. So uh, you have to be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Paul, uh, you know, the thing that attracts me to the piece so much is the themes of, of youth and age. It seems to me that there's this constant look at the young and the old and how they view love and life and mm. and the, the the wonderful character of madame uh, arnfeld the <laughs> grandmother who teaches her young charge that that summer night smiles only three times at the young who know nothing the fools who know too little and the old who know too much <laughs> is 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 this Something that makes it quite unique, where you've got the shifting viewpoint all the time uh, throughout the piece of, of old and young love, as it were, because yeah. it's something that's so universal, love, isn't it? I think people identify and they adore this musical because of just what you've just said, Michael. People can identify with those generations. And, and you've just picked up the most perfect quote because... The, the play, when it starts, opens with the grandmother teaching her granddaughter the facts of life and the meaning of life and how she, and the daughter, the granddaughter is just waiting for the pearls of wisdom to uh, come out of Madame Armfelt's mouth. Uh, as the play progresses, of course, there's a lot more that comes out of Madame Armfelt's mouth <laughs> in her judgment of her own daughter. And that, that kind of, that, that the intermediate generation, of course, is where a lot of the characters fall in their 40s when things are going wrong and there's tensions in love life and everything else. And the extremes of the generations, the grandmother and the granddaughter, observe all the mayhem caused by the, the intermediate generation and thereby is a lot of the humour of the play. I think the, the reason that sometimes is a great writer, is that what Paul's just been talking about, Sondheim has the ability of pinpointing what these different generations are thinking, how they are feeling about every point in the story, and expressing it with a great deal of clarity in the words and, and the tunes, and you can understand immediately, you relate to them immediately, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. The young people are, want to get on with the here and now, and feel they're being stopped from doing that. The middle-aged people are having made mistakes and trying to correct them. And, you know, Madame Armfelt, the wise old owl, is sitting back and commenting on it all. And it's all crystal clear. And you, you understand immediately who these different characters are. That's his great strength. He has it in common with somebody called Mozart. <laughs> and do you think, I mean, do you think Sondheim is really a theatre lover's choice, that it's, it's mm -hmm. set for, for people that are in the theatre, the people who have grown up in the theatre, so that there is something so theatrical about it that it sometimes puts people off. Uh, because sometimes, for me, and I, I, I remember going to see Into the Woods for the first time on Broadway with Bernadette Peters and was completely blown away. And then the next day, reading the reviews, it completely trashed the show and it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me uh, that Sondheim is someone that isn't immediately appreciated and that it takes a bit of time uh, before people can really grasp it in the right way. Um, is, is, 
am I making too much of it, or do you think it's do you think it's a, a, a conventional wisdom? This form? I think when I was privileged to to ha to be running uh, my own theatre in the nineties, I had the luxury of uh, being able to put on a Stephen Sondheim musical once a year for about eleven years. And the audiences grew and grew and grew. And now, of course, he is much more accessible, respected. The critics now love him. Those critics that used to not enjoy his work when they first came out, uh, mainly in the 70s and 80s, That's right. I, I think have completely changed their mind. And mm. like many composers, some composers unfortunately live their lives uh, before the general public have taken them to their hearts. But mm. I don't think that's the case with Steve and Sondheim now. Mm. I think there's a great uh, admiration and love of his work, mm. uh, far more than when I started directing them in the 90s. Now, you met him, of course, and he came over to see uh, your production of Merrily We Roll Along. That must have been incredibly stressful for you to have Maestro <laughs> on your right and, uh, and as the production unfolded. Uh, how did you cope with that and what was he like as a, as a colleague? Well, it, it, it was what I call a pleasurable stress because you, you were aware that the privilege of having... Uh, this composer in the rehearsal room for four weeks, he'd rewritten Merrily We Roll Along that only lasted for 17 performances when it first came out. Um, so this rewrite was very important to him. Otherwise, I don't think he would have chosen to rush to Leicester <laughs> in the UK. But So I was aware that he was there purely for the rewrites and the, his marvellous uh, book writer, George Firth, was there as well. I was very, um, the cast you can imagine, the nerves. I tried to get as much ready as possible for, before he arrived. And, and at first there was a bit of a kind of director, writer uh, tension, but, um, uh, there was a one incident where Stephen Sondheim asked me to change the direction of something so that everybody did something differently. I kept kept my cool. I said, okay, uh, I'm not sure I think this is going to work, but we'll certainly do it. That's what he likes. He wants collaboration. And, and do you know what? When he did see the difference, he actually said to the cast, no, no. I've made a mistake here. It was much better how you were originally doing it. Now that broke the ice. Big and, time. And, uh, big time. And uh, of course, it was a stress on me from the cast. You know, they were just sort of wanting to do everything that Stephen Sondheim had said. But from that moment, the rapport between us was fantastic. And right through to the opening night, we were going back, rewriting things. Some directors are fearful of uh, writers in the room. Uh, that taught me a lesson that far from being fearful of the writer in the room, you must embrace it because mm. out of that, the changes, the excitement of trying things out, that's what produces the best production. Mm. And, and when, 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 when you've uh, conducted a, a new work and you've had the the composer around. Uh, how has it been for you to, to have been working on a new piece uh, and then having a composer at your, at your elbow? Well, in the sort of music that I will have tended to have been doing, in other words, a contemporary opera, most of the time the composers are just deliriously grateful to have the thing done at all. Uh, um, <laughs> but of course, the, it's, it's true. These people, they know what they've written down. I mean, mm. uh, and, and the more skillful the composer, the more accurate they have written what they want. I mean, Benjamin Britten is a perfect example of that. Um, uh, uh, there's a little bit more leeway in some areas of what Sondheim has written down. But, um, but the rhythm is usually very precise. That's, that's where you have to follow it. But I, I think that... Uh, Paul has just given me the green light to say to him about some bit in the production, oh, I think it might be better if we did something else. And he's obviously going to do what I say based on that story. So I'm looking forward to this very much. Well, this, this could be the start of a beautiful relationship. <laughs> we're not see it already. <laughs> so, uh, Paul, just talk a little bit about the um, creative team that uh, you've been putting together. I mean, we'd be delighted to have Wynne on the, on the, on the podium. 
and we've also had a look at the designs. And you want to just talk a little bit about some of the fabulous designs that we, we're not going to tell anybody what they are, but just talk a little bit about uh, the team. Well, you've got you've got to create an environment. Um, uh, Charlie and Phil are the designers, and the environment of a little night music needs to be very flowing. There's lots of scenes. Uh, and the action completely flows, as does the music. Um, so, so you've got to float in and out of these Norwegian, uh, these Swedish, Swedish woods. Um, the, the, the whole aspect of a little night music has an Ibsen-esque quality about it, because although some people think Ibsen is like very doer and serious, in fact. Ibsen can be extremely funny. It's so awful that it's funny. <laughs> and productions of, of, of Ibsen that bring out that quality are the, always the best. So, so the design has to be what I call looking as if the characters are floating on thin ice. Uh, so it's, we wanted to get an abstract setting. So it feels like we're going through the woods, but we're also on thin ice. Uh, chandeliers could appear, um, beautiful furniture can appear, but and, and Madame Armfelt's house has got to appear at the end of Act One, so there's a few challenges there. But the more things can happen with fluidity, the more beautiful the production is going to be, and I'm pretty sure we're going to get that. And uh, of course, we had go, Win. Sorry. I was just going to say on on the Ibsen thing, the ability that Sondheim and Hugh Wheeler have had in it is to start you off with characters who seem to be operetta characters. You, you seem to have a, a handle on who they are. And in the course of their relationships, they turn into something more serious, more Ibsen-esque, you know. That, and, and it's done very, very clearly. Uh, uh, that's why I think, um, you know, Hal Prince, the original director, called this whipped cream with knives. <laughs> <laughs> and Sondheim used to say apparently that uh, Prince enjoyed the cream, but Sondheim preferred the knife. <laughs> That's uh, right. And, and it is that, you know, it is a kind of Viennese Zacher torta, but without the cream. Mm. And, and uh, it's got an edge to it. And uh, any production that can bring out the edge, which is exactly what Paul's just been saying, is going to be a worthwhile thing. Mm. And, and in terms of the cast, when we, we had progressed quite far uh, and we're hoping that we're going to be able to get some of those singers back, Paul, is that, is that do you think we could? I, I, I think, um, yes, you're quite right. We did go a long way in the casting. Um, it would be my delight if we could get that cast back, of course. Um, the, the trouble with today's situation is that you know there's so many actors and musicians uh, are now out of work, so they are just waiting for people like us to give them a platform for their talent again. So mm. I feel sure we'll get the most perfect cast, no matter what. I, I'd like you to know that I'm available for the role of Frederick Edelman. <laughs> well, I've always wanted to start a show. It, 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 at the start of this show, he's come back from his office. He's a lawyer. He come back, comes back to the office and his 18-year-old wife, he's in his early middle age, um, his 18-year-old wife is at her toilette. And the first words that he sings are um, the, the, the sweet, as the sweet imbecilities tumble so lavishly onto her lap, there are two possibilities. A, I could ravish her. B, I could nap. <laughs> so I'm already sold on the character, uh, uh, you know. And uh, you know, there's a bit of grit in it. It's fun. You've already got the sort of style of it in the very first couplet. Uh, and so, well, if you get stuck for Frederick, I'm sure I could nip up. Uh, <laughs> I will bear you in mind. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Paul, if you'll consider me uh, in drag as Madame Armfelt, I'll... Oh, <laughs> now you're talking, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's those, a rather better those, <laughs> those, those rather acidic remarks will be so <laughs> like you, Michael. <laughs> well, guys, it's been so lovely talking to you about this. And uh, here in lockdown, uh, it's, it, it seems that next year is years away, but uh, time will fly. And uh, we'll be back, and uh, yeah. you will all be able to come and and see this production uh, of a little night music that we'll be mounting 
at the 2021 festival at the Buxton Opera House. And uh, we, we look forward uh, to, to hearing your thoughts on it all. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Wynne and Paul, for, for joining us at this uh, uh, Biff Digital. And um, we just wish you all all the very best and we'll see you on the other side. <laughs>